welcome this morning. Right. Praying that you've had a blessed week for sure as uh, weather is greatly improving all the time. And I know that we're getting a little bit more showers, right? Which brings about what? May flowers, right? What everybody's looking for. So uh, we just didn't get very much in April. So we're going to make up for it here this first couple of weeks of May. Uh, it is good this morning, right, as uh, we're gathering together and praying, right, as we've already unpacked so much this morning uh, through just, uh, not just through what we've done so far as this service, right, but even in small groups, and I am excited uh, to, 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 to be able to open God's Word with you this morning. Um, really wanted to give just a little bit of backdrop as uh, where we're going to this morning. Um, really, really, really seeking the Lord in uh, just uh, several things, uh, but uh, really, really looking to be obedient in what I'm sharing in this morning, right, uh, as I was mowing uh, the yard uh, this week. Uh, man, that's, that's a good time with the Lord. Does anybody else have a good time with the Lord on a lawnmower? Yeah, I, I don't know what it is about the lawnmower uh, and the Lord, but uh, yeah, uh, our spirits match up very well. Uh, cutting, cutting grass, so it's uh, it's, uh, it's, it's always, always a good time, time and, and I assure you, um, it, it was, was very plain and clear as I mowed where where we're parked at this morning. morning. We're going to be in the book of Micah. Uh, that's Old Testament, right? And I know even as I say that, uh, hey, it's okay if you don't know exactly where that's at. That's the reason why the Bible has a uh, table of contents in there, right? That it will direct you and show you Old Testament. Uh, you'll be able to find that. So if you want to go ahead and begin turning towards that uh, this morning, uh, it's exactly where we're going to be. Uh, chapter six um, is the is the passage that we're going to be looking at. And I know I know even as I, I, I say that I do have a a lot of ground to cover this morning. So I do want to be a good steward of, of our time um, as well as uh, everything that the Lord has in store. So. Uh, this, this morning, morning, Lord, we come, come to you just truly, truly, truly grateful and thankful, thankful especially um, as, as, as we are unpacking your, your word. Uh, God, God, we, we want, want it to be all about you. You, you are worthy of it all, as we just sang. Uh, that, Lord, Lord, above everything, everything else, else you, you, you are deserving, deserving of not, not, not just our praise, but you're deserving of our life. And Lord, I'm, I'm just praying this morning as uh, we, we open your word, uh, as we look at it, that this morning, right, I'm praying that it would do, uh, Lord, what I know that it can do, and that's uh, by the work of your Spirit. So please uh, help guide our time this morning, uh, open our ears and our eyes and our heart, and Lord, we're, we're excited to receive everything that you have. So we're asking all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Definitely right. As last week, um, we, we looked at um, this more excellent way, right, being driving from our time from Sunday nights. Uh, as we've been studying um, some spiritual disciplines, uh, but more importantly, right, we've been looking at spiritual gifts on Sunday night and all that that entails. And if you've missed that time with that, right, I, I encourage you to uh, hook up with me, right, and we'll give you some great material for you to go back and unpack. Uh, but, um, man, we've spent a lot of time wanting to be able to use what God has gifted us all with. And uh, it's the most important part, right? Because we love to look at someone else in the church and say, man, I wish, right? I wish I prayed, sang, spoke, you know, whatever the case may be, right? I wish that I could, I could do or behave or act like they do. I wish I was as close to God as they were. I wish all these things. And God says, guess what? I have exactly for you what you need. I've given you your gift. And it's not supposed to look like someone else's because it's your gift. And you should be using your gift. So it's our reasoning for unpacking that. And last week, right, we kind of closed that with making sure that we know that, hey, we can be above, uh, we can be above room and board. We can do everything that we're supposed to do. But if love is not that guiding factor, right, that is the most excellent way. And I know that there's way more that we can unpack with that. But 
diving right in to this morning, I want to look from Micah, a great prophet in the Old Testament. If you're not spending any time reading this book right, I want to encourage you because Micah is a, is a close running buddy with Isaiah, right? They're about the same time in church history, about 700 B.C. Um, and he's speaking some very, very tough words as, as he's delivering this, right? He's ministering for about 20 years as he's doing this. And things are not good with the church. Things are not good whatsoever. And uh, God's kingdom, right, his, his people have been divided from northern kingdom and southern, southern kingdom, so to speak. And you're looking at Judah and Israel, and both of them have went away from the Lord. Both of them have been kind of taken captive by others, right? Israel was taken captive by the Assyrians, and then Judah's going to be taken captive by the Babylonians. And Micah is spending some time saying, hey, this is what the Lord is telling you all. You need to wake up. Can I tell you, every Sunday morning, the Lord is saying, wake up. That we need to hear from him, right? Not, not from anything else. And it's not just Sunday morning. It's any time that we're diving into his word. But as we gather together, there's no greater time for our hearts to be stirred, for us to, yes, uh, to, to be shaken if we need to be, but also for us to be in encouragement, for us to make sure that as we're walking through this, we realize we're not alone. And that's what this enemy is so good at doing, and that's exactly of what's taking place here, because there is tons of corruptions going on all throughout God's people, right? Every single bit of it. And it wasn't just the average ordinary believer that had fallen away. Even God's closest people, right? Those judges or the priests, the prophets, some of them, they had all fallen away from God. To the point, right, that it was making God absolutely sick to his stomach in the way that his people were responding to him. They had absolutely no devotion. Now, as we hear that, right, I want to, I want to make sure that we're going to try to pull this in proper context and not make it say anything that it's not supposed to. But I believe there is a word for us here for 2024. I believe there's a word right here for us right at Bethlehem. And I, I want to make sure that as we grab a hold of this, that we apply it to our lives. And I know I say that all the time, right? Because we can gain all of this that we want. But if we're not living it out, it means absolutely nothing. It means absolutely nothing. And that's what Micah is wanting to make sure. God's people, they understood, they, they knew. So the question this morning is, what does the Lord require of you? That's, that's it, right? And I know that there is way more than we have time to unpack with this one question, right? Because we're, we're going to be looking at it from this one instance. But I assure you, we're not going to cover all the ground that's loaded up with that, with that question. You see, we've, we've made answering this question optional. Right? We love free grace. Come on, am I talking to anybody here this morning? Right? We love free grace. We love salvation. We love the cross. We love heaven. We love the perks, right? We love the mansion that's being built. We love the streets of gold. We love all of that great stuff. But when it comes to what God requires of us, we tend to push that to the side. We tend not to even talk about that, right? Because that would mean that there would be action on our part. And that's what we, we tend not to like. So we're going to be looking from what Micah says. And I, I, I want to make sure that you see because there's so much that's taking place. And I didn't put all these verses up, but I want you to go with me starting in verse 6 of chapter 6 of Micah. And he says, with what shall I come... What, Excuse me. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? 
Oh my gracious, right? There's, there's deep questions being asked right here, and we're just going to really quickly, right? He's saying, hey, I can do all of these things that I know that the Lord requires. I can present you, God, with all of these offerings. Sacrificial offerings that were taking place, right? Burnt offerings, right? And we can go on and on and on about all that Levitical law, right? All those things that were taking place and that was supposed to take place so that we could show our worship to God, right? We could talk about the oil and everything that it entailed. He's talking about even giving his firstborn for the sin that's in his life. Verse 8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? See, we can, we can continue to go through these motions. We can check the boxes. We can come to church. We can do Sunday school. We can give our offering. We can help with missions. We can, we can smile and wave. We can, we can do, do all of this religious sort of things, right? And truly miss what God is requiring of us. And I, I know as we hear that, we, we, we hear and know of all those good things because for most, we don't even do the good things. Oh, I know. I know it hurts. So we're not even pushing that to the table, right? We're not even offering up stuff. We're not even offering up those things that we would say that we know that are good. So, so even looking at that, right, that's this is not even where we're going this morning. The Lord says, I require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. I know, I know we've looked at this verse before, right? And I, I want to make sure that there is so much that's packed inside of this. And there's so much that I want us to get, right? Number one, we need to act. We've got to act. And we've got to act justly. That word is jam-packed with a lot of meaning because justice, we've really been blasted with that from a media standpoint, especially when it comes to social justice, and we could go on and on and on. That's not my intent this morning, right? This command, it made a lot of sense to people because they had abandoned justice altogether right here in biblical times. Right? Not only in personal ways, but in a national way. Right, God's people had totally walked away from what they had been called to do when it came to justice. And you, you have to understand from the very beginning, right? from, from, from the way that God orchestrated everything, He's always ensured that His people would not only know what it is, but that He's just. And you see, we're, we're, we're missing that because we're equating now in 2024 justice in all kinds of ways that are far from the way that God ever intended it to be. Right? We, 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 we scream and we cry for justice. Right? We, we want people to be held accountable to that. We want to see people pay for their crimes. But how about letting me slide? How about turning the other cheek when it comes to the justice that I am supposed to get? God wants his people to be just, church. He wants us to understand that. And earlier in this book, right, we read that God's people, they, they, were, they were not acting justly with dealing other pe with other people, right? And they act shamelessly in so many other ways. And I want to encourage you, go back and read. This is a small book. Uh, you can unpack and read that this afternoon and be caught right up very, very quickly. I know that you and I both want to live in a world where there is justice, right? And we, we're expecting that to play out, and we, we want to see that. But God is not just talking about that type of justice here. I need you to grab a hold and realize that today could be that day that you could understand exactly of what's meant here, right? And if you've already received God's justice in your life, hey, you ought to be the most excited people in here. 
If in your life, right, if, if you've already had the, the, the substitutionary death of Jesus, the moment where Christ was crucified upon the cross on your behalf to the point that you were declared not guilty. Oh, my, oh my gracious, gracious. Is, is there anything, anything else that, that could be, be greater, greater said today, right? The moment where God imputed, right, where he deposited his righteousness into your life. And if you've not experienced that, right, maybe you've heard it, maybe you've grown up, maybe you've been part of these religious activities, maybe you've walked away from it. Today is the day, right, where you can grab a hold of that, where you can stand rightly before God knowing exactly of who that you are and who that He is. So what does acting justly look like right now, 2024? There's three words that I believe that we could just sum this up very, very quickly this morning. Integrity, oh my gracious, honesty, and concern. And not just concern for anything, right, but concern for the weak. Because this is, this is what describes God's heart to the best when we see justice talked about throughout the Bible. Cover to cover, right? So just think about integrity in this way. It's kind of almost one man or one woman's, right? Kind of your moral code wrapped up, right? This, this moral code, just not just principles and values because we can have all kinds of values and principles that are far from the Lord. Right? We can be raised in certain ways where we may have good principles, but that may not mean they're the same principles and values of what God wants. We must make sure that our moral code is wrapped up in the truth of God's Word. That's what's settling it all, right? That's what's making it so very important. Right? When we talk about integrity, it should be integrity before the Lord. Right? That everything that we do, that we stand above reproach, right? That what's being said of us, yes, they can say what they want, but as long as it's not true, it really doesn't matter. Our moral code is so very important. You see, honesty, right? Commitment to truth is a sure sign, and it should be manifesting in your life to the point that people see your integrity. And you see, right, when, when God's people, when they embrace this truth of God, they embrace God's commands, right, they begin to live out what they read and what they hear, and then they start showing this justice to the weak. It's the reason why that we give you tons of mission opportunities in that same category, most always going to a desperate need all around us from coast to coast to shining sea, right? Every part that we can possibly grab a hold of so that you can actually love people in desperate need. But you don't have to go that very far. I have a community and people in desperate need. In desperate need. And they need to hear these truths. And we're going to be declaring those starting tonight as we preach God's word. I know I said preach. Even though we're reading, that's going to be declaring God's word publicly from the old courthouse steps. And I encourage you, if you've not been a part of that, hey, come out and be a part. Even if this year you don't read, just come and sit. Celebrate. I can assure you this is not happening everywhere in our globe. We want to hear God's words this morning. This is how that we act justly, right? Not just because of religious activities that we can bring about, right? None of those means anything. We want to be doing it for the glory of God. That His name be growing, right? Not for a social movement or to look good in social standards, right? We need to be passionate about things that God's passionate about. And guess what? If we do that... It doesn't take very long for us to have a lot of critics. It doesn't take long for us to have a little buzz going on about us. Why? Because we're going against the grain. Because the world is telling us everything but that. We need to be on fire for the Lord. Let us strive every day, right? Every day to treat people this way. To treat them justly. Why? Not so that we can say, hey, did you see how I helped so and so? Did you see how I loved upon them? You see how good I am? We're talking about for the glory of God to grow His kingdom. That's what it's about. Number two, we need to love faithfulness. 
We sing, great is thy faithfulness. But there's so much more. There's so much more in what we're seeing here, right? To love kindness, right? To love it, to, to be faithful in it, right? Mercy is the word that most see here in their Bibles. Right? It's, that's what most of you are looking at, right? Which makes great sense because God's people right here in this time, they had abandoned their willingness to show mercy. Man, I don't, I don't know how that this plays out in your life, right? But it, it was happening in their personal lives as well as in their nation. And can there be anything any greater said of our nation right now? That mercy is not an avenue or a thought process that most people want to have? Matter of fact, I feel like that it's almost uh, the exact opposite that, that most are more willing to step on someone's head than they are to extend a hand. Why is that? And the church is almost falling victim to this very, very thing, right? That, that we're seeing this play right back out again. That uh, Lord forbid that we would actually get our hands dirty by extending them to someone in desperate need. See, this word right here in the Hebrew, it translates so wonderfully, right? It almost, it's almost a beautiful picture of a loyal love that contains mercy. And I just want you to, I want you to think about that for just a moment, right? Is that not what God has shown us? Because is there anyone any more loyal in your life than the Lord? Is there anyone any more loving in your life than the Lord? Just, just grab a hold of that. That's what God's showing us over and over. And He's faithful to show us mercy. And I know you all are much better people than I was, right? I get that. And I know that as I look back over my life, there are many moments that He should have turned and ran from me. But instead, He was wooing me. He was calling me. He was wanting me to come back home. And the same that he's doing for so many people, sinful people, people that do not look like church folk today, that do not look like us, that do not act like us, that do not talk like us, but Lord forbid, right? I know, I know in the moment that we see these wonderful things start to be happening around us, it, it's in the moment where we see it demonstrated the best through the cross. Let us never look past it. It's always, always leading people to a moment, right? A moment where his son climbed upon it and he gave his life for us. So what does love look like right here? Doing it faithfully in 2024, right here at Bethlehem. Hey, three words. Once again, love, grace, and forgiveness. Love, grace, and forgiveness. We need to be loving people. We spent time last week talking about it. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about forgiveness and how important that was. What about grace? Our hearts will be shown, right? And they'll be shown very quickly if we love the world the way that we say that God says that we're supposed to. It's, it's very, very easy to see. If we truly love people the way that God tells us to do it, they'll actually, we'll actually begin to see people that are in need. You'll actually see people and, and hurt. And you won't have to hear your pastor tell you about stories that happens throughout the week. You'll actually have stories of your own. I'm not a super Christian. I'm beneath you all. And I assure you that as I live my daily life, right, God's Spirit on the inside of me that's working all around, that every day He shows me someone in desperate need. And whether that's physically or spiritually or emotionally of what's going on. And he wants you to be able to do that. But we've got to take off our worldly glasses. Come on, I'm telling you. This morning, right, those worldly glasses that we wear, it's so easy to see all that. We can see all the garbage and everything that's going on. And we can get so caught up in that and truly miss who God's placed right beside us. Wanting us to minister to them, wanting us to help them, wanting us to love upon them. And to live our lives in such a way that it displays something wonderful. Wonderful in a way that it points them to Jesus. And even if they never trust in Him, guess what? You have still done your part. Oh, 
Oh, man, Bethlehem, right? Let us love in ways that are so authentic, right? It's not phony. Come on, right? When, not those ways where, we, where, where Cousin Eddie comes up, right, and we really don't want to hug on him. I mean, in a way that we truly embrace someone and love them. In a way that we would truly extend a hand, right? In a way that we would truly forgive and let go of all of that wrongful things. To have that patient grace, that patient love, especially when we're wrong. And I don't need to go into all the details and all the times when God showed us these very things. When He gave us grace, when He gave us mercy, and when He loved us because He's still doing it right now. Right now, right now, right now. And if you live to tomorrow, he's going to do it even more tomorrow. And if you live the next day, he's going to do it even more then. Let us think so much differently than our culture is telling us to do so. Making us align with this party or that party or this color or that color or this denomination or that denomination. Let us be bonded in Christ. Let us grab a hold of that concept. To be someone who truly cares about other people's to the point that, guess what? It may inconvenience us. It may get us off of our routine. It may put us out. It may even cost us something, our time, our money, our resources, to meet a need, to be available, to help, to talk, to cry, to share, to have a shoulder to lean upon. I know our culture says it's got to be about me, but God says it's got to be about Him. Oh, and how that we notice the needs of ourselves so much. This morning, our lives are filled with so much that is so self-absorbed, right? Come on, Kyle Yankee included. I'm not looking down my nose, right? I want you to see so much of our lives is all about us. We need to look in the lives of people that God's placed around us to invest in them, to help grow them, to help lead them. God is saying there's something that pleases Him. There's something that's so much more satisfying. Right? And I, 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 I want to make sure as we hear what God's saying that we grab a hold of that. I don't want my kids to, 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 to look at me and think, oh my gracious, right? I want them to look at God. I want them to look at Him and what He's done because I assure you without Him, I would not be here today. I want them to grow up and act justly and to love faithfully, especially when people don't deserve it, right? And especially when people want to take advantage of you all the time. I want business people who are honest that would go above and beyond of what's called, right? Someone that actually values hard work. Someone that actually would clock in even when they're not getting paid. Someone that would invest their time for the kingdom of God. I want wealthy people to say, hey, guess what? God didn't give me more money so that I could leave it to someone else to blow it in a month. That I'm actually growing my account so that I could help care for those people. Those kids in desperate need. You see why? They don't have health care in Haiti. They don't have someone to look after them. They're living in a gutter where tires are being burned and trash right beside them. In the same stream of water where there's cows drinking. And someone washing their laundry and someone else using the bathroom. And they're filling up a, dr a, a jug to take back to their family. So much more. God's calling us not to just look at them in victims and say, Oh, poor pitiful them. I wish I could help. You can help. You can help. I want people who are honest, and God does. He wants us to be a group of people that says, no matter what, I'll stand up and I'll confess my sin, that I'm the chief sinner in here, and guess what? God forgives me. He wants us not to hide behind it and cover it up. He wants people to be able to do what we're called to do. He wants political people not just to grow their agenda and their kingdoms, but they would actually serve the people who they've been, uh, been put over, right? Not someone just to pad their own pockets or someone to take a bribe. God says, I want my people to love mercy because I do. And that's what he's about. And to show that mercy to other people because that's what he constantly gives to us over and over and over. Number three, we're called to walk humbly, right? We need to walk humbly with God. 
And in this one, man, humbly is a word that is so overwhelming. In the Hebrew, right, it, it translates out to actually be lowly. To be lowly in status, right? Not just in status, but in stature. Now, I don't want us to jump to this negative thinking almost, right? Because when we think about someone being lowly, we kind of think of them as being the least. We kind of think of them being someone that's uh, uh, beneath us all. But I want you to understand that this word has nothing to do with us being weak or unsu unsuccessful or insignificant. Do you think that Christ was any of those things? The most humble person that we've ever known. Faith and obedience. This is what this describes, right? And without these two things, right? Without these two activities being in your life, you'll never be able, I will never to be able to act justly or to love faithfully. Right? And I know that pride is so overwhelming. I know it's something that grabs a hold of us so easily, right? It's something that makes it all about me. Doesn't God just place all these people in my life to make my life better? I mean, sometimes, isn't that how we kind of think, right? God, I'm so thankful that you put that person in my life. Look at all they did to help me. Oh, man. And not that that's, that's not a bad thought, thought process, process sometimes. But, but are, are they, they really in your life to just to help you? you? Just, just to make, make your life, life better? better? You, you see, see, right, right here, here inside of this text, this, this group, group of people, people they, they have become, become so filled with with pride, right? Not, Not just, just one kingdom or the other, other Israel, Israel and Judah, right? They, they had become just so overflowing with pride. And as a result, they had reduced this covenant relationship that God had promised them, right? All the way back, all the way back, right? To this spiritual checklist. Right? You, you, you know how that sometimes we feel? But I, I did. I went to church today. I did go to Bible study last month. I didn't even put some money in the plate. Let's, let's not be self-consumed. Right to the point that we just we just go through the motions, right? Just to just to almost do sometimes as we we do in filling out the blanks, right? Hurry up so we can have the answer and then we can move past it. Humility is something that says, I believe God, right? So guess what I do? I obey Him. I actually do what He tells me to do. And this is exactly of what God means when He asks us to walk humbly with Him. Philippians, I know that we walked through that 2, 5, and uh, through 8. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Right? Humility, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of what? Death, even death on a cross. The most horrific death. Right, one that would say that they would be accursed by God if you died upon a cross. And Christ says, I willingly do so. I willingly do so for you and for me. Jesus is the great example. He's the one that we should be measuring ourselves, right? And he put himself under the authority of God the Father, right? So that he could provide this perfect sacrifice over, right? And doing it in such a way, right? That he calls us to do the same thing. To come under this authority. The authority of God the Father. To live our lives not just so that we can say we did but so that we can live our lives for His glory. And I know, I know that's hard, right? I know that our hearts are sometimes so far from that that they don't even come close to reflecting that. My life included. My heart included. Here's what I want you to know. It's possible. We can actually do this thing. 
We've been given everything that we need in order to do so. And we don't have to live like hell. And we don't have to stumble every day. And we don't have to fall backwards and fall into our sin and say, Oh, man, I can't believe I did that again. We can walk hand in hand with Christ with the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, helping us to overcome anything. We've been given and the person and the people, right, that, that, that allows this to take place, you will walk humbly before the love, you'll, before the Lord. You'll be able to act justly, to be able to love in the way that God's called you to do. But we have to begin to believe, and not only believe, we must obey. We need to learn from the mistakes that we read right here in Micah to a point that we know that they have fallen away. We need to know that God's truth, yes, we can have them in our minds and we can quote scripture scriptures forwards and backwards but if we're not obeying us it's just knowledge it doesn't mean anything we can continue to live and choose false gods false prophets false ethics and everything else that's not of the Lord do not look too long away from him we're capable of doing this over and over and over we are doing this over and over and over and every time you and I we willfully choose Something other than God, we're choosing disobedience. Hear that out. That hurts God's heart. It's exactly what nailed his son to the cross. And I need you to be able to understand of the seriousness, right? That every time that we're dishonest, every time that we choose not to believe what God says because mama didn't say so. We need to realize just like we heard growing up. Honesty is the best policy. If we become angry and agitated with someone or something, what does it say about what, we, what God says about how that we're supposed to act? What does he say about unrighteous anger? If you don't know, it's a sin. We need to understand of how important it is how about with our speech? It seems like that I'm around a lot of guys that really, really struggle a lot of time with their speech. And profanity always comes out. And it's always amazing, right, of how that they quickly say, Oh, I didn't mean to say that. How easy that it becomes or how that in conversation in church. I know that you all think this never happens, but as someone lets us work slip out. And we, they, it's just like that they feel like they're the least of the least, right? But if they were at five star to this afternoon and let it fly out, we would never think anything about it. What does our speech say about who that we are? Unwholesome talking, I want you to know, is so wicked from God, and it's something that it, we're so easily allowed to just come through our mouths because it's coming from our heart. We don't like to think about that. We like to say, oh, I didn't really mean that. But God's Word tells us we did. That's what's breathing on the inside of us. How about when we're not doing and using our gifts that we've spent so much time talking about for God's kingdom? Is it because we don't believe that God's actually gifted us? What would it actually look like for me to use my gifts? How about when we don't share the gospel? We don't even care about enough about someone that we know that's right beside us, whether it's at work or wherever we're at. That is going to hell if they take their last breath today for us to even say, hey, can I tell you the truth? How about when we don't give in a way that's pleasing and honor to the Lord? Is it so much that we think that maybe God doesn't really have claim to our finances? That maybe he's not supposed to have that this is actually mine and I work for it? I know we could look at a thousand other examples, right? I know that we could look at so much more, right? But the root of every one of these issues is pride. Every bit of it's pride. Every single bit of it. Refusing to believe and obey 
And And man, wouldn't wouldn't it be be awesome awesome that that if we here as Bethlehem, Bethlehem, right, as as much much as it hurts, right, as much as we don't want it to be, that sin is always the result of the lack of our faith. And the reason why that we can't get out of the rut that we're in is because we love our sin more than we love God. You want to talk about heart hurting? You want to talk about a gut check, right? A look in the mirror? I don't think there's anyone any more devastating that could be said. There's something in our lives that we would say, God, but I just can't trust you with that. James tells us, but he gives more grace. More grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but but gives grace to the church, to the humble. If we truly believe the word of God, until we believe it, we're never going to humble ourselves in the ways that's pleasing and honoring. But once we do, you don't have to read any more self-help books. Once you humble yourself before the Lord, you don't need to say, Pastor, what is God calling me to do? Because he'll he'll begin to work in your life life immediately. Immediately. He'll put you exactly of where that he wants you at. He'll put you on the path of growing his kingdom, right? I'm not talking about building wealth from you. I'm not talking about attaboys from someone else, right? But when you start living for the Lordship of Christ, your life will change drastically. When we begin to walk with the mindset of how important for us to not only experience justice, but to live to see it truly play out for for faithfulness uh, to the body of Christ, for it to grow right, when all of these things begin to happen, we'll actually begin to practice what we preach. This morning, church, I don't know. I know that these words can be so, so overwhelming. Know that even as we hear it, right, we, we start almost just kind of marking it off on our own little personal checklist, and we almost begin to say, okay, I do pretty good here, and I'm pretty good here, but man, I'm not so good here. And then we start kind of just compartmentalizing, right, and just say, okay, but if I would just do this more. If I just start spending more time this week, God, I promise you, I'm going to get up early. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm actually going to pray. I'm actually going to start doing what I'm supposed to do, and then guess what happens? Monday morning hits, and all hell breaks loose. Everything that you can dream of comes against us, and then we start saying, well, my gracious, if I'm going to be honest, if this is what it means to say yes to the Lord, do I really want to say yes to the Lord? Every time I do, every time I get on fire for God, all this bad stuff starts happening. Tires go flat, and air conditioners go out, and kids get sick, and arguments break out, fussing and fighting, and then there's a bill that comes in the mail. How am I going to pay for it? Every time. And we say, it's much better if I just don't say yes to God, and I just do me. And here's what I want you to know. That's the cheese on the trap. And as soon as we we nibble it, it it smacks smacks us right against the head. And we're so far from God. We're stuck right in that mess. We're stuck right in that trap. And now we get so convicted and we think we're such a terrible person. How could I take the bait again? And God is saying, let Let me lift that off your neck. Let Let me set you free. free. Let, Let me help, help you out. out. And, and by the way, go ahead and take, take the cheese when you leave. He's a good God. He knows that without his help, there's no way you can do it. He knows that you're going to mess up every single time. But with him, it's limitless. And he's wanting a group of people to say, guess what? I don't care how many times that trap smacks me in the head, God. I'm going to say yes to you every time. I'm going to say yes to you every time. And I want to live. I want to do what is required of me for you. God, we come to you right here in this moment. Lord, I know that there's so much 
that's happening in our lives, and I know that there's so many things that comes against us, and I know that it's almost an overwhelming thing for us to be able to think of if we can keep up to this mark. Lord, we realize and we know that without you, we cannot. But Lord, with you, we know that we can. That Lord, you would help us every step of the way for us to be able to, 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 to truly act this out. To love in ways that are pleasing and honor. And for us to walk, to walk with you. So Lord, I pray for decisions all across this place this morning. I would pray, Lord, for decisions that they need to be made. That, Lord, we wouldn't, we wouldn't fret or worry about what may be coming tomorrow. That, Lord, what, or what happened to us the last time that we said yes. That, Lord, today you would give us a courage. That you would give us a boldness, Lord, for us to truly suit ourselves with you. To put on Christ is what, what Paul says. That today, Lord, just as we put on our shirt and pants, Lord, that we would put upon your virtues today. And that, Lord, as we clothe ourselves with your righteousness, that, Lord, your spirit would begin to work, work in and through us. All the while growing your kingdom and, Lord, yes, us, us being blessed in so doing. Lord, I pray right now all across this room that, Lord, this morning that we would spend time seeking your face. That, Lord, in those areas, in those ways, Lord, that maybe we've, we've not met the mark, in those ways that we've been a disappointment, in those ways, Lord, where we've fallen short, that there wouldn't be condemnation here this morning, Lord, but this would be an opportunity for your Holy Spirit to convict us, to say, God, we want to be restored to you. We want to be made right with you. So Lord, I pray knowing, knowing that there are countless, countless people that would love to take time and pray, pray with you this morning, if that would be you. And if you feel the need to pray at the altar or pray right where you're at or step to the side or to the back, that we're asking for you to be obedient to God. So Lord, I pray right here in these moments, asking you to have your will, your way, in Jesus' name. Amen. Church.